Welcome! Bienvenue! Caribou! How? I'm back to school! Let's start the year off in a good place by looking at the evolution of human flight. So you're going to want to add some of these notes to your engineering notebook. Why human flight? Well, Wilbur Wright once said the desire to fly is an idea handed down to us by our ancestors who looked enviously on the birds soaring freely through space. Ah! on the infinite highway of the air. So, aerospace engineering. Here are some sweet photos that kind of um, outline the history. We're going to start here. Looking at how did we progress? Well, it was mostly through the applying of science, technology, math, or and math through engineering. So, so far, there's not really anything you need to note down, but um, right here is probably where I would start. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was really kind of the first brain behind aerospace engineering. Oh, look at that flying machine. Factors such as technology prevented his ideas from becoming a reality for 600 plus years. So moving on, the uh, the first type of flying was flying lighter than air. And that was designing and flying a lighter than air vehicle. Um, that was this balloon and that was in 1782. So it the thing that inspired this was rising smoke. As smoke went up, they thought, okay, hot things go up. So let's put smoke inside a balloon and then put a basket under it and whoop, then up you go. So there's some smoke. Uh, then we got into heavier than air vehicles and that took a long time. So in 1903, so now we're into 1900. So really there's only a couple things before 1900. It was Leonardo da Vinci and then it was this lighter than air, air balloon. And now we're into the Wright brothers. Here's a plane. And uh, that was in 1903 was when their first flight was. You probably want to note that date down. They built their concepts from others using horizontal and vertical surfaces and the elements of wing design, which they had very limited knowledge of. There was no airfoil. Airfoil. Aerospace engineering began to grow. In one century, human flight progressed from a flight of 6.8 miles per hour to thousands of miles per hour for aircraft and tens of thousands of miles per hour for spacecraft. So that was all, again, from the 1900s until really where we are right now. And things continue to progress at very, very fast rates. So this happened because of science, technology, engineering, and math, and um, applying these things and learning from what other people have done. So they imagined it, they designed it, they tested it, they failed. And, and we've talked a lot before in previous classes that you want to be able to test quick so that you can fail sooner, so that you can see, succeed a lot faster. So they learn from their failures and they try again. They say, hey, that didn't work. And you think about these SpaceX rockets. They're trying to land them. After they're shooting them off, they land. Well, they fail. And then they figure out, well, what failed? What went wrong? Let's fix that. Let's try something again. And so that's how they had successful landings on with SpaceX rockets. Keep this in mind that we're doing this um, regularly is define the problem, generate these concepts, develop a solution, make a prototype and test it and see, did it work? If not, then go back. And if yes, then present it, share it out. Take a look at commercial aviation, the catalyst for growth here were legislation, um, also competition and fame. Charles Lindbergh was the first to cross the Atlantic Ocean in 1927, and he won the Ortiz Prize. Amelia Earhart was the first woman to do a crossing of the ocean, and that was just five years later. Uh, so there was a, um, a need for fast transportation. For people wanted to get places faster. We wanted to deliver packages faster. Um, the government got involved, that was this legislation. And then um, military started to have a major impact. So if we look back to these dates, uh, we're at 1927, 1932, so World War I has finished and there were some fighter planes in World War I, um, biplanes and triplanes, the Germans had those. But then let's get into um, World War II here in the, um, the late 30s and early 40s. And that's when engineers really began to look at more efficient aircraft because they realized how effective aircraft could be in World War I and um, how much of an impact that could have on the success of the war. So there was a huge demand for aircraft in World War II. So you might want to note that that was a big catalyst. And that furthered the advances in aerospace engineering and bettering manufacturing capabilities um, that they, they improved so that made it possible to make more things, better aircraft, more precise improved performance, navigation aids, they developed radar. Uh, so a lot of things improved over the early 40s. Um, so much so that a supersonic flight was achieved in 1946, where Chuck Yeager flew 1.06 Mach, which is over 700 miles per hour. That's really, really, really fast. So again, really important to note some of these dates. Uh, because they do show up in the final in May. So you want to have these written down. So again, commercial aircraft continue to develop uh, personal 
aircraft, then sport aircraft like hang gliders, and then we start looking into rotocraft. Da Vinci conceptualized this around 1480, and Sikorsky engineers um, a wide-scale production of helicopters in 1944. So we're talking um, into World War II. Uh, that was really the beginning of wide-scale production. And again, this was something that had to go through a lot of design tests, fail and prove, um, and was a lot more complicated of um, getting this rotary motion to actually work. But here's a couple cool examples. Then we're moving on to rocketry. This is a rocket. <laughs> so obviously planes continued to improve, but let's look at how rocketry was developed. The Chinese were credited as using it in 1232. Russian space scientist Solokovsky developed equations in 1903 to reach space, although they had no means to doing so, but uh, he was one that was the first to do that, which we'll talk more about him later, and we will see more about these equations later. And then American Robert Goddard was considered the father of modern rocket propulsion, and through his help and some of the work that he did, the first liquid-fueled rocket launch um, happened in 1926. Competition was the thing that drove much of this accomplishment um, for the space race, and it was largely between the United States and Soviet Union. So again, there was a, um, similar to the Lindbergh crossing the Atlantic to win this 1927 prize, there was, that was a competition there, right? So that kind of helped with aircraft development. Between our two countries, there was this, a different kind of competition. We saw, as the Americans, we saw the Russians put a satellite in orbit, um, and it was called Sputnik in 1957. And there is a little picture of it, and it just sent a little bleep. That's all it did. But the Americans didn't know what that bleep meant and what it was doing. We got really freaked out about it. And then they put an animal in space in 1958. So then the U.S. said, hey, we got to start throwing stuff in space, too. So we put Explorer 1 in 1958. And then we decided we, gotta, we have to have an organization. So let's do this National Aeronautics and Space Act, and we'll call it NASA. And that's where we got NASA, 1958. Then Kennedy said in 1961 that the U.S. is going to land somewhere on the moon in a decade. And so we're like, how is that possible? Well, the U.S. had to figure that out. And they had nine years of intense engineering failure and learning, um, even at the expense of some astronauts' lives um, to get this to happen. So America won the race of the moon. They got there in 1969, barely made it, uh, just a few months to spare, and success to determination, there we are. Now it's the foundation for continued exploration. We continue to do some really cool stuff in space. We've sent things to Mars. We're hoping to send people to Mars. We are now into a space competition, and so where, where it's actually prize money. So again, we talked about Lindbergh. We talked about the US and Soviet Union space race. Well, then there was the Prize Foundation, and it gave $10 million to, to fly a three-passenger vehicle 100 kilometers into space, twice within two weeks. So this 100-kilometer mark is sort of like this imaginary elevation where we say, that's space, although there's a huge continuum there, which we'll talk about soon. And then there's this Google Lunar X Prize, um, sending something to the moon. The Northrop Grumman Lunar Lander X Challenge, again, landing something on the moon. So there's all these sorts of challenges now that private companies are getting involved in. And that's what we get to look at what in the world is next. Where are we going to go next? Are we going to get to Mars? What's going to happen? So there's really, really exciting, cool things happening in aerospace. I love aerospace. I love it.